charges in the killing of an eight-year-old bring a rare news conference and the politics of naming a new Supreme Court justice in tonight's Spotlight Politics. Here with all that and more are Amanda Vinicky and Heather Sharon. So today we know Mayor Lightfoot appeared with Police Superintendent David Brown and Cook County State's Attorney Kim Fox to announce charges in the fatal shooting of an eight-year-old in Little Village. Here's what they said when asked about this rare joint news conference today. The tragedies that we have seen during the course of this year and last and historically um, requires us to come together. It is a, uh, you know, a unique opportunity for us to have a public showing of what happens behind the scenes. I think you'll see um, more opportunities for us to demonstrate uh, a unity of purpose. Heather, does this indicate, you know, a deep freeze uh, thawing between the CPD, uh, the mayor's office and the state's attorney? Well, I don't know about that, but it was certainly in everybody's best interest to play nice in front of the cameras today to show a unified front in the wake of this horrific death of eight-year-old Melissa Ortega. Um, but I think that the animosity between Kim Fox and Mayor Lightfoot um, has been overstated. Let's not forget that, that Lightfoot endorsed Fox for re-election, and certainly she has had her criticism of Kim Fox. But the fact of the matter is, is that they're both Democrats. They both are on the same team and their both successes depend on each other. And I think sometimes it's an easy way to sort of shorthand tension between these two offices that have very different goals and very different needs and very different powers um, when it comes to case, when it comes to crime in Chicago and Cook County, it's a, a very complicated issue. Amanda, does the mayor stand to benefit from better relations with uh, Kim Fox, especially regarding tackling Chicago's violence problem? Well, yes, if it comes to actually tackling the problem, if there is resolution, if crime goes down, if this leads to something, then yes, that would, of course, take aside politics for a heartbeat. That would be the best for all of Chicago. Of course, that is the goal that everybody wants. Politically, yeah, it would look good to get along. I, I think there are some people, it is easy, of course, politically to have somebody to point a finger at. I, I think Heather's right. Sometimes there's overblown tensions. Some of it, however, is very much, I think, real. You you want something done and it, it, it isn't happening when it comes to crime. And so, yes, I think the, the long and short of it is if they can come forward and show that they're working together, that would make her look better. As we just talked about, she's gearing up for reelection. Now, Heather, we know today you covered city council meeting um, where Alderman Anthony Beal tried to get a lawyer to help uh, city council members explain why this was a contentious issue. Well, um, it's very complicated, but essentially Anthony Bill and 29 other older people want their own lawyer so that when Mayor Lightfoot or, you know, the city's corporation council rules against something that a majority of the council wants, they can sort of push back. Because right now, if the mayor rules something on the council floor out of order and the corporation council's office agrees with her, sometimes the city council is out of luck and they are very, very very frustrated about that. And I think today was a great example of the use of that sort of parliamentary procedure to prevent something from happening that the mayor doesn't want to happen. Now, she says she's in favor of the city council having their own lawyer. She just wants them to do it in a rational, thought out, comprehensive sort of way, because the motion on the floor today didn't say how much this would cost. So some aldermen were reluctant to vote for it because they didn't want to put the city on, a hook, on the hook for potentially, you know, more than $100,000 for a full-time staff person. So this is a debate that's going to come up, but for people who love Robert's Rules of Order, today we have a bad day. <laughs> Robert's Rules of Order. Speaking of uh, contentious issues, the battle over a new ward map continues between the Latino and the Black caucuses. Heather, what is the latest? Well, it appears that delegates from the Black Caucus and the Latino Caucus will meet behind closed doors on Friday, and maybe they will make more progress than they made in all four of the public hearings because the grand total of progress in those meetings was Zippo. Um, the clock is ticking. Eventually, if 41 aldermen don't agree on a map, this will go to voters in June with the June primary to decide what Chicago's word map should look like, and that will really determine in the balance of power for the next 10 years. Amanda, what's the likelihood that this ends up with the voters? 
Well, it, it, I would love, of course, who wouldn't? What reporter wouldn't love to be at that closed door meeting? And that is often where we see the, these things battled out. It is a matter of math. I'm not quite sure, given the promises that the Latino and the Black Caucus has, have each made how you can find a resolution, but certainly it is in their interest to do so. They still do have some time. I believe that the deadline to do this is sometime in May. So we, we are right now are freezing our fannies off, right? Maybe by the time the flowers are blooming again, they'll have worked it out. Okay, so Arnie Duncan looking like a candidate for mayor today, criticizing the Chicago Police Department and Lori Lightfoot's handling of the violence problem. Amanda, you covered this today. If he runs, how much trouble could this be for Lightfoot in her reelection? Well, of course, we. it all depends as well on who else may enter the Chicago Teachers Union Vice President, Stacey Davis-Gates, has not said no, and her name is often mentioned. Arnie Duncan, the fact that he has come out and said, yeah, I, I'm thinking about it, that's a pretty big sign that he's going to declare. Of course, anything can happen, but, but that's big. And it could be an issue for her, given that she previously, um, just the entire dynamic has changed from when she first won office. She was unknown then, really cobbled together a uh, majority that came from a lot of corners. You knock those off, and she doesn't have the support as well from progressives, really. Uh, right now, they've gotten very upset with her, and of course, the CTU front, so it could spell trouble for her. But then again, Arne Duncan doesn't have an organization. He doesn't necessarily have foot soldiers. He may get money through the backing of the business community, but that's something that you need as well, people to knock on doors for you, get petitions signed and whatnot. Heather, we mentioned this earlier in the show. He also slammed her gang assets seizure plan. Is that going anywhere in city council? Well, that is a good question. And I am waiting to see whether the city council's public safety committee schedules a vote sometime in the next three weeks or so. The city council meets again at the end of February, and they could take a vote on the measure at that time. He really echoed criticism from people like Cook County Public Defender Sharon Mitchell, who said this, this ordinance isn't going to do anything except target people who um, have family members who are in gangs and maybe share a car with them or or share a home and that they will find themselves in the crosshairs of this. But we heard Superintendent David Brown at that news conference this afternoon saying that this was a tool that the police department needed to to dismantle the gang like the gangs involved in killing Melissa Ortega. And that is going to be a very powerful argument for aldermen who are staring down reelection in about a year and who want to at least be able to tell people, OK, maybe crime is still really bad, but we did everything we could think of to address it. And that is why there is going to be a big push to get this through, because nobody wants to be seen as not doing everything possible to prevent another child being killed by a gang in Chicago. Such such a tragic story, uh, the Melissa Ortega, that we're hearing and reporting this week. Um, so in national uh, news, a little bit of national politics, U.S. House of Representative Ethics Panel continues to review allegations against Congresswoman Marie Newman, that uh, allegations that she offered a political rival a job to stay out of the election back in 2020. Uh, Heather, did Newman break the law? What's going on here? Well, she says she didn't. The House Ethics Panel says, well, maybe there's evidence that you did. And of course, this all involves, um, you know, her before the 2020 election, working with a, you know, potential future rival and sort of coming to an agreement where perhaps she would give him a job and then move forward. And you can't do that. You can't offer things like that. It's against the law. Um, but what's interesting, of course, is that Marie Newman is caught in an intra-democratic party Swabble. She faces Sean Caston in a redrawn district. So she was already sort of facing an uphill battle as any Democrat redistricted into the same district is. So this is another sort of piece that she's going to have to sort of figure out. And there were lots of questions because, and it will give Sean Caston an opening to say, look, you don't have to deal with that. I'm a reliable pro Biden progressive voice in Congress. Let's just move along here. <laughs> All right. So uh, some of Illinois wealthiest residents, they are ponying up the cash for Richard Irvin's gubernatorial gubernatorial run, including a television ad campaign that launched this week. Amanda, uh, is this campaign ad stretching the truth? 
So the issue in the campaign ad is that Richard Irvin says that he called in the National Guard, that Chicago didn't do anything when there was unrest, when there was looting. We, we covered it in Aurora as well as the city of Chicago, when in fact the only person who can actually activate the National Guard is the governor of Illinois. Granted, that may well have come at the request of a mayor, for example, somebody like Richard Irvin. So um, it is certainly stretching the truth there. That is what these campaign ads do. The difficulty right now is that reporters haven't had the opportunity to ask him directly. He's up on air, commercials, had a very lengthy bio introduction uh, that came out digitally, but has not at this point in time held any sort of press conference or one-on-one -on -one interviews with journalists that will be covering this race who really want to ask questions such as that. And Heather, you've done some reporting on this as well. Not the first time you've seen ads stretch the truth. Sure. Um, you know, Richard Irvin is clearly addressing people who are worried about crime, and this plays into his sort of tough on crime approach. The problem is, is that I think it's really important that we know exactly what powers a mayor and a governor has, especially, especially something so fraught with Chicago um, and the National Guard. The other thing I want to mention is that his rhetoric really echoes Ken Griffin, Illinois's, uh, you know, richest person, the, the owner of Citadel Hedge Fund, and he was also very critical of the way Governor J.B. Pritzker has responded to the surge in crime. So that's part of this as well, and we're all waiting to see what Ken Griffin does. And I know we'd sure like to ask Richard Irvin whether he would accept <laughs> money, Ken Griffin's money. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of questions that, that we are all eager to a answer. A whole bunch of questions. <laughs> Political reporters uh, across the state dying to ask him. Uh, Heather Sharon, Amanda Venicky, thanks as always.